Hey folks, my name is Will Hamilton. I'm a PTR certified professional tennis coach and welcome to the Fuzzy Yellow Balls free email course. Over the next few days, you are going to learn what it takes to hit a high level forehand. And the first thing we're going to do is look at the pros. We're going to look at Federer, Nadal, Ivanovic, Hontakova. We're going to look at all their forehands because we want to know what all their forehands have in common. What are they all doing the same? Well, it turns out they're doing five things the same, and we call these things the fundamentals, the five fundamentals of the forehand. Then we're going to look at the forehands of some real-life club-level players, weekend warriors, folks just like you, and what we're going to see is that the difference between Roger Federer's forehand and Kevin, the club player's forehand, is not in the small details. It's not that Roger does something differently with his wrist or that his backswing is a little bit different. What separates Roger from our amateurs is the big stuff, these five fundamentals. Roger and every other pro we're about to show you does these five fundamentals and they do them extremely well every single time they hit a forehand and amateur players do not. Now you probably recognize this guy standing behind me. This is Roger Federer and he probably has the best forehand ever. But Roger's forehand and every other pro's forehand on tour contains five elements. So let's walk through what these five elements are. To start, right now we have Roger waiting for the tennis ball and he is going to execute the first fundamental which is called the pivot and the shoulder turn. It's alternatively called the unit turn. And if we watch it real quick, this is basically where he just gets his body sideways. He starts to turn sideways. Now if we play it again, he is going to pivot with his outside foot, his right foot, since he is right-handed, and his shoulders are going to turn sideways. And again, he's begun to get himself sideways and face the side fence. Now, a very important concept to understand with the pivot and the shoulder turn is that it starts the racket take back because your shoulders are turning sideways and not because you're using your arms to move the racket side to side. In fact, both hands are still on the tennis racket right now. So let's watch it again. The shoulders turn sideways, the racket starts to come back, but both hands are just along for the ride right now. They're not doing anything. Both hands are on the tennis racket. Now Roger's ready to execute the second fundamental, which is to take the racket all the way back. So here we have him at the completion of the pivot and the shoulder turn. And to start, he's going to let go of the tennis racket with his non-hitting hand. Once he does that, he can use his hitting arm to get the racket all the way back. Now, you can also see that as he brings the racket back, he's going to extend his non-hitting arm out across his body, about shoulder high, and more or less in line with the baseline, and that's going to help him judge the oncoming tennis ball. Now, if we go back to the completion of the pivot and the shoulder turn, you'll notice that as he takes the racket back, he's taken a couple steps to get to the tennis ball. But the key thing to take away is that once he's got the racket back and his non-hitting arm extended out, he is going to have all of his weight loaded up on his outside leg. And this position he is in right now, that is the completion of his preparation. And this body position is going to allow him to swing forward correctly in the next step. The third fundamental that Roger's going to do is swing forward to his contact point. And to do that correctly, he has to do three things all at the same time. And we're going to talk through each one of these elements individually. We've got Roger at the completion of his preparation. And right now, we're only going to focus on his feet. We're going to ignore everything else. Now, remember, at the completion of his preparation, all the weight is loaded up on that outside leg. And as he begins to swing, he's going to push off that leg. That's pretty simple. Weight's loaded up on the foot, and he just pushes off it as he swings. The second thing we're going to focus on is his upper body. Now, he is sideways at the completion of his preparation, but as he swings forward, his body rotates back towards the net. So at his contact point, he is more or less facing the net. The third thing Roger's going to do, here we are at the completion of the preparation again, is swing with his tennis racket and hitting arm. We're only going to focus on that. And as he swings, the racket drops down and then swings forward. And if he was tracing out a line with his tennis racket, it would look like the letter C. 
So let's go back to the completion of his preparation and watch this whole thing. And you can see that he's doing these three things all at the same time to get to his contact point, which is a little bit out in front of his body, and the strings are flat on the back of the tennis ball. The fourth fundamental is the follow-through, and that allows Roger to decelerate himself and the tennis racket smoothly. From contact, let's focus on Roger's upper body to start. And Roger's going to continue to rotate after he's made contact with the tennis ball, and that lets him slow his body down during the follow-through. Going back to contact, now let's focus on the tennis racket. And Roger extends out in the direction that he's hitting the ball, and then he turns his forearm and his wrist over as one piece, like he has a watch on and he's trying to check the time, and he brings his arm and tennis racket across his body in a smooth and relaxed motion. Going back to contact, let's watch the whole motion, and you can see that by doing this, by executing this fourth fundamental, Roger is able to slow himself and the racket down smoothly. So the stroke's over. Where is this fifth fundamental I was talking about? Well, the fifth fundamental has to do with the swing path. The path, the racket travels along from the start of the motion through contact and into the follow-through. And here's what's fundamental about the swing path. Let's go to the completion of the pivot and the shoulder turn. Here we've got Roger again. Both hands are still on the tennis racket. Well, when Roger lets go of the tennis racket with his left hand, his non-hitting hand, the racket is not allowed to stop moving. He has to keep it moving over the course of the backswing and into the follow-through. So let's see what that looks like. He lets go, and the swing path is continuous. That's the word we want to focus on. He has a continuous swing path. Racket doesn't stop moving through contact and into the follow-through. And it's very important to highlight this because those first four fundamentals, well, we kind of broke them up, so it might have looked like his stroke was segmented, pivot and shoulder turn, racket back, drop down, swing to contact, follow through. But when it's actually in practice, let's watch it again, his racket doesn't stop moving once he releases it with his non-hitting his left hand. So we've just seen that you can boil down Roger Federer's forehand to five fundamentals. Sure. Well, it's not just Roger that's executing these five fundamentals when he hits a forehand. It's virtually every single other pro on tour. So today we're going to look at the strokes of some other professionals. Nadal, Del Potro, Roddick, Ivanovic, Hantakova, and so on. And we've got these players split screen. We're going to have them up on the screen side by side. And despite the fact that some of these forehands are going to look a little bit different, we want to focus on the similarities, again, these five fundamentals, and you are going to see that they are all doing these five things. So with that in mind, let's get started. The first two players we're going to look at are Andy Roddick and Fernando Verdasco. You can see that they are now on the green screen behind me, and I'm going to fade out, and we're going to look at their forehands. So here we have these two guys at the beginning of their respective motions. And to begin, right now they're facing the net, but to start their motion, they will pivot and turn their shoulders, that first fundamental, and it's alternately called the unit turn. They pivot with their outside foot, and keep in mind that the outside foot is going to be different for Verdasco because he's left-handed and Roddick because he is right-handed. But they both pivot with their outside foot, and they turn their shoulders sideways. Now, if you watch this again, it's sometimes called the unit turn because the entire body is turning sideways as a unit. Now you can also see that they both have their hands on the tennis racket. Their hands are still on the racket. They are not using their arms to take the racket back side to side right now. It's the shoulder turn that is starting the racket take back. Once they've pivoted and turned their shoulders, now they can move on to fundamental number two, which is to take the racket all the way back. And they do this by first releasing the tennis racket with their non-hitting hand and they use their hitting arm to get the racket all the way back. And you'll notice that their backswings look different. Roddick's elbow, for example, is cocked up a little bit higher, but at the completion of the backswing, they both have the racket all the way back. Doesn't matter that it might look a little bit different. Now, you can also see that when they release the tennis racket with their non-hitting arm, they extend that arm out across their body, about shoulder high and in line with the baseline for balance and judgment of the oncoming tennis ball. Finally, these guys are taking a couple steps to get themselves positioned for the tennis ball, but once they've got the racket back, 
and their non-hitting arm extended out across their body. They both have the weight loaded up on their outside leg, despite how they were moving prior to that. All the weight's on the outside leg, and this body position they're both in allows them to swing forward correctly in the next step. To get to contact, they have to do three things all at the same time. Let's focus on their feet to start. Both these guys are going to push off their outside leg as they swing. Now we're going to focus on their upper bodies. They're sideways right now, but as they swing to contact, their bodies rotate back towards the net. They're more or less facing the net at contact. Finally, if we go back to the completion of their preparations, they're going to drop the tennis racket down and swing forward, and you can see that the path that the racket travels along sort of looks like the letter C. Now, if we watch this motion from the completion of the preparation one more time, let's watch the entire thing. You can see they do all these three things at the same time to get to their contact point, which is out in front of their body, and the strings are more or less flat on the back of the ball. From contact, the fourth fundamental is the follow-through. Once the ball leaves their strings, both these guys are going to continue to rotate their bodies after they hit. That allows them to slow their body down nice and smoothly. If we go back to contact, they're going to extend out in the direction that they're hitting the tennis ball, and once they've done that, they're going to turn their forearm and wrist over as one piece, like they have a watch on, they're trying to see what time it is, and then they're going to bring the racket across their body in a smooth and relaxed motion. If we go back to contact and watch the entire follow-through fundamental number four, you'll see that this motion allows them to slow themselves and the tennis racket down smoothly. Let's go back to the start of both these guys' forehands, and we're going to talk about that fifth fundamental, the continuous swing path. So right now these guys have pivoted and turned their shoulders, and they've got both hands on the tennis racket. But what we're going to do is play this in slow motion but not stop the clip. And you'll see that both these guys keep the racket moving over the course of the backswing, into the forward swing, and into the follow-through. Let's look at some of the top women on tour, Anna Ivanovic and Daniela Hontakova, and see how they execute these five fundamentals. Here they are at the beginning of their motion, we have fundamental number one, the pivot and the shoulder turn. Their bodies turn sideways, both hands are still on the tennis racket. Fundamental number two, the racket comes back, other arm extends out across the body, all the weight is loaded up on the outside leg. Fundamental number three, swing into contact. Push off the outside leg, body rotates back towards the net, racket drops down and swings to contact. Fundamental four, the follow through. Body continues to rotate, they extend out in the direction they're hitting, turn their forearm and wrist over like they have a watch on, and then they bring the racket across their body in a smooth and relaxed motion. Let's go back to the beginning of the entire motion and look at that fifth fundamental, the continuous swing path. Once they release the racket with their non-hitting hand, the racket never stops moving through contact and into the follow-through. Today we're going to look at some amateurs and see how they execute the fundamentals. We have Lucien, who just started playing, John, who is a club player, and Kevin, who played in high school and is now just getting back into the game. Before we get started, I want to thank each one of those guys for being our guinea pigs, for allowing us to critique their strokes, because hopefully their example will help y'all at home improve your forehands. First up, we have Lucien, who's been playing for a couple months. He's joined a couple leagues. He's really into the game, and he's looking to improve. Now, Lucien's strokes are representative of the strokes I see on public courts, all the time. A lot of weekend players have strokes just like Lucien. So let's see what that looks like. Okay, let's go back to the beginning of his motion and the first thing you're going to notice is that Lucien is only holding the racket with his right hand, his hitting arm. So already he's not going to be able to execute fundamental number one. He has to have both hands on the racket. So to start his motion he does not pivot, he doesn't really turn his shoulders, but he does take the racket back with his hitting arm. Just comes straight back. And remember, it's supposed to be the shoulder turn that starts the racket take back and not the arm. Now, his shoulders do turn sideways a little bit, but that's because the racket is coming back, his arm's coming back, that's pulling his shoulders back a little bit, as opposed to the shoulders turning and bringing the racket along for the ride. Let's move on to fundamental number two. And here we have Lucien, taking the tennis racket all the way back, racket's back now, but you'll notice when we look at his feet to start, 
he's got the weight on both feet as opposed to his outside foot, his right foot. The second thing, his body is still not sideways. It's more or less facing the net. And his non-hitting arm is down by his side. It's not extended out across his body like it should be. Now let's rewind it a little bit and then watch him take the tennis racket back. And what you'll notice is that he kind of takes it back like a pendulum, swings back like this. Now, if you remember back to all the pros we watched, none of them had that pendulum backswing. They had the racket here, somewhere up there, because taking the racket back like a pendulum is going to interfere with two more fundamentals later on down the road. So now Lucien's going to swing to contact. Let's begin by looking at his feet. Does he push off his outside leg? Well, yes, he does. But the problem is, because the weight was on both feet, he also pushes off his inside leg. He only wants to be pushing off that outside leg and not both feet. Now let's look at his upper body. Well, he's not really turned. He's a little bit sideways, but there's not too much body rotation during his forward swing. And again, that's because he didn't get completely sideways when he was preparing. Now let's move on to his racket and his arm and look at how he swings the racket. Well, remember just a short couple seconds ago, I was talking about how Lucien took the racket back like a pendulum. Well, that is going to interfere with his swing up to the tennis ball. All those pros we talked about, they were tracing out a C when they swung forward. Lucien, because he's got that pendulum motion, it's more like a U. So what Lucien needs to do is take the racket back a little bit higher, and that's going to allow him to drop it down and then swing forward as opposed to take it back, stop, and then swing and hit the ball. Let's move on to the follow through. And here we have Lucien at contact. And as he begins his follow through, let's look at his hitting arm and his racket first. Doesn't really extend out in the direction of the tennis ball, but he is turning his forearm and his wrist over like he has a watch on. So that's good. That's going to allow him to bring his racket across his body in a smooth and relaxed motion. If we go back to contact, there's also not too much body rotation after he hits the ball. And that's related to what he was doing earlier in the motion. He didn't really turn much to prepare, so he wasn't going to have much rotation into the ball, and he wasn't going to have to slow himself down too much by continuing to rotate after the ball has left his strings. Let's move on to the fifth fundamental and see if Lucien has a continuous swing path. Let's watch his stroke one more time. Now, at first glance, it may look like he never stops moving the tennis racket, but with that pendulum swing, the racket's going to come back stop and then swing forward. So that's another reason you don't want to have that pendulum swing in there. By taking the racket up a little bit higher, tracing out that C, well then you drop the racket down, swing forward, but it's never stopping. It's a continuous motion. But again, the U, got to stop and then bring it back down. So by taking the racket back the way he does, he is preventing himself from executing the fifth fundamental correctly. Now we're going to do something fun. We're going to split screen Lucien and Tommy Haas. You can see them on the green screen behind me. We are going to compare their strokes side by side, fundamental by fundamental. And we're using Tommy Haas because he has great classic mechanics. He's a fantastic model. And what's going to happen now is I'm going to fade out and we'll take a look at their respective strokes. To begin, Tommy has got both hands on the tennis racket, but Lucien, of course, does not. And when Tommy pivots and turns his shoulders, that's obviously flawless. Pivots for the outside foot, shoulders turn sideways, racket is coming back because his shoulders are turning sideways, facing the net. But he is taking the racket back with his hitting arm. So the racket's coming back because he's using his arm, not turning his shoulders. Tommy, to complete his preparation, well, he's going to take the racket back. He's going to release and take the racket back with his hitting arm now. That non-hitting arm extends out across his body, about shoulder high, in line with the baseline and the weight is now loaded up on Tommy's outside leg. Well, Lucien, he takes the racket all the way back with the hitting arm, but the non-hitting arm stays down by his side, doesn't extend it out across his body. He is, of course, facing the net. He's not sideways like Tommy is, and he's got the weight on both feet as opposed to the outside foot like, again, Tommy has done. When these guys swing, well, Tommy's going to push off that outside leg. He's going to rotate his body back toward the net, and the racket drops down and swings forward. Lucien, however, he pushes off both feet, does push off the outside leg, but he also pushes off the inside leg. And his body, not too much rotation there. And because he had that pendulum on the backswing, 
Well, he's going to swing forward, but he doesn't trace out that C like Tommy does when he is swinging. From contact to follow through, Tommy extends out in the direction that he's hitting, then he turns the forearm and the wrist over like he has a watch on, trying to see what time it is, and he continues to rotate after he hits. That allows him to slow his body and the racket down smoothly. Lucien, well, he doesn't really extend out in the direction that he's hitting. He does turn his forearm and wrist over like Tommy does, but again, he's lacking that extension into the court, and he doesn't really rotate his upper body too much after he hits. Let's move on to our second amateur, John. John is a club player, and when he pivots and turns his shoulders, he does a pretty nice job with this first fundamental. It's not the cleanest pivot and shoulder turn, but he has executed all the various elements necessary for this step. Done a good job turning his shoulder sideways. His feet, his pivot is a little bit ambiguous, but he has pivoted. And he's got both hands on the tennis racket, as opposed to Lucien, who had released too soon. But I will say that on other forehands, John has released too soon. So this particular part of the pivot and shoulder turn is a little bit inconsistent. When John takes the racket back, he's got the same problem Lucien had, that pendulum backswing. That's going to interfere with the fifth fundamental. He's also loaded up the weight on both feet as opposed to his outside foot. He has done a nice job of turning his shoulder sideways and extending his non-hitting arm out across his body. But on other forehands we looked at, John didn't extend that other arm. So this particular part is a little bit inconsistent. Let's move on to the third fundamental. When John swings the contact, he pushes off both feet. Again, that's because he didn't load up properly on that outside leg. His body doesn't rotate fully. He's not facing the net at contact. He only turns a little bit. And because he's only turned a little bit, his swing with the arm and the racket is a little bit constricted. It's too much arm in there, and it's not the arm and the body turn working together. And if you look at him at contact, he's kind of shrugging. He looks like he's tight, like he's really muscling the ball. And again, that's because he doesn't have that shoulder turn in there to help his arm swing the racket forward. Now, if we pay attention to his non-hitting arm for a moment, you'll notice that if we go back to his preparation, first of all, he's got that arm out across the body. But then he brings it out of the way, but then it comes back and he's bear hugging himself. And what that does is it constricts his shoulder turn. So one of the reasons he's not facing the net, that he doesn't get that full turn in there, is because the other arm is coming across the body, holding his shoulder sideways. And this motion, the bear hug, is very common at the club level, and it's why a lot of club players have way too much arm when they're swinging to hit the ball. If you add all this stuff up together, the fact that he's not pushing off his outside leg, the fact that he doesn't have enough rotation in there, and the lack of rotation is making his swing constricted, he's arming the ball, that moves the contact point back, and you can see he's kind of hitting the ball off of his front hip as opposed to out in front of his body, which is where all pros make contact with the ball. The follow through is a function of what was going on prior to and at contact. And because John was doing a couple things wrong, it's gonna make his follow through a little bit awkward. And his follow through looks a little bit uncomfortable. He's facing the net at the completion of the follow through. He hasn't really extended out in the direction that he's hitting. He has a little bit, not a ton. Has turned the forearm and the wrist over like he has a watch on trying to check the time, that is good. But that bear hug has made the whole motion look a little bit uncomfortable, like I said before. And so if he fixes the things he was doing prior to contact, if he swings properly, that's going to help him get that smooth motion on the follow through. And finally, the fifth fundamental, John doesn't have that continuous swing path. That goes back to that pendulum motion he had in there when he was preparing to hit. So let's keep this train moving and compare John's forehand with Tommy Haas's. And here they are at the start of their motions. Both pivot and turn their shoulders. But remember back a minute ago where I said John's pivot was a little bit ambiguous. Well, there's nothing ambiguous about Tommy's pivot. Tommy executes this fundamental and every other fundamental very deliberately. You can see clearly he's pivoted and turned his shoulders. John, the quality of the execution isn't quite there. So it's not just a matter of doing the fundamentals. It's how well do you do them. The better you do them, the better your forehand's going to be. So let's watch these two guys execute the second fundamental, and we'll freeze it right here. We'll start with Tommy. All the weight is on that outside leg. Knees bent, you can see it's all there. 
His racket's all the way back, body is of course completely sideways, and his non-hitting arm is extended straight across his body. Great extension with that left arm. Let's transition to John. Well, his preparation is a little bit more ambiguous. What do I mean by that? Well, how is his weight distributed? It looks like most of the weight is on his outside leg, but you can't really tell. You look at how Tommy's got all the weight on the outside leg, and you go back to John, well, there's a stark difference there. John just hasn't really emphasized getting all the weight on that outside leg. John's racket is all the way back, but again, he had that pendulum backswing, so he's not going to be able to trace out that C. And if we look at his non-hitting arm, it is sort of extended out across his body, but it's, it's pretty low, and you compare how he's extended his arm to how Tommy has extended his arm, there's an obvious difference. So you could say that John has done most of the fundamentals, but he has certainly not done them as well as Tommy has. Again, Tommy, it is absolutely clear that he has all the necessary elements for fundamental number three. And to go back to that word ambiguous, it is way less clear that John has executed all the necessary things to complete his preparation. When we watch these guys swing forward, let's first focus our attention on the feet. Tommy had done a great job loading up on that outside leg, so he can really push off when he swings. John, on the other hand, because it wasn't really clear where he had distributed his weight, the push off is a lot less clear. He's certainly pushing off his outside leg, but there might be a little inside leg in on the action as well. Let's move on to the upper body rotation. Tommy is sideways to the net, so is John. And when Tommy rotates back during his swing, he is now facing the net at contact. He's done a fantastic job, unsurprisingly, of rotating back towards the net. And you'll notice that he's hitting the ball out in front of his body. Looks very comfortable at contact. Well, John doesn't rotate fully when he swings. He gets a little bit of rotation in there, but he's clearly not facing the net at contact. And look at what that does to his contact point. It has pulled the contact point back. It's basically in line with his hip and it's not out in front of his body like Tommy's. There's a clear difference between contact points between Tommy and John. Tommy, like I said before, looks very comfortable. John looks a little jammed, and that has to do with the body rotation. Let's move on to the follow-through. From contact, Tommy extends out in the direction that he's hitting, turns the forearm and the wrist over, brings the racket across his body, and of course, he continues to rotate after he hits. Looks very smooth. Nice and easy way to slow himself and the tennis racket down. Well, John, because his contact point was a little off, it's going to make it difficult to decelerate in a comfortable way. He kind of extends out in the direction that he's hitting, but he doesn't really extend out like Tommy is. He could use some more extension on that. And he does turn his forearm and wrist over like he's trying to check the time on the watch. And, of course, he brings the racket to the other side of his body. But his upper body rotation after he hits is... A little bit awkward and again we said this earlier his follow-through sometimes looks uncomfortable that has to do with his contact point being a little bit off let me round out our discussion of John's forehand by talking about the quality of John's execution he did many of these fundamentals but some of his execution wasn't as deliberate wasn't as clean as Tommy's execution so it's not just a matter of whether or not you're doing these fundamentals you need to do them well, and you can keep refining how well you execute these fundamentals. Let's look at our third amateur, Kevin. Former high school player, hasn't played for a little while, but now is getting back into the game. And Kevin is the best of our three amateurs. Now we're going to look at two of his forehands. We've got the first one on the green screen behind me to start. As he begins his motion, the pivot and the shoulder turn, let's go of the racket a little bit too soon. Same problem that Lucien and John had. He does pivot and turn the shoulders fine otherwise. So this looks good. As he brings the racket back, you'll notice that the racket is coming up. He's going to have that C motion in there, and he is the first one of our amateurs to have that. And this C is going to facilitate a continuous swing path. So Kevin, unlike Lucien and John, has that fifth fundamental down. Kevin also has done a nice job of loading up on his outside leg. He's got the weight there. But his non-hitting arm is pointed into the court. Same problem as Lucien and John doesn't extend it out across his body like he should. When he swings, well, he doesn't actually push off 
his outside leg. You'll notice that the weight actually centers over both feet and then he pushes off both legs as he swings. So that's a bit of a mistake. And he rotates back towards the court to get his body facing the net, but he's a little jammed on this forehand. He's not fully rotated. But if we look at the swing, the racket does drop down and swing forward like we talked about before. So the swing, the path the racket is traveling along is correct. Because he's a little jammed at his contact point, follow through is going to be a little bit awkward. Doesn't extend out in the court as much, he, as much as he would like, and he doesn't turn his forearm and wrist over like he has a watch on. Just kind of goes over there, so it's a little bit of a constricted follow through. So on that first forehand, Kevin made some of the same mistakes as Lucien and John. Well, let's look at a forehand he hit a lot better. This is from the side perspective, and when he pivots and turns his shoulders, both hands are still on the racket. So he has corrected that error in this particular forehand. When he takes the racket back, he's got that C shape in there. Weight is loaded up on the outside leg. Body is sideways. Other arm is still pointed into the court. But if he were simply to point that arm at the camera, then his preparation would look fantastic. Pretty good as is, but it would be great preparation if he just changed the direction he was pointed, pointing that arm. To swing, pushes off the outside leg perfectly. That looks fine. Body rotates back towards the net. He's facing the net now at contact. And if we rewind it, watch the path of the racket, drops down, swings forward. And at contact, this looks great. This is a nice contact point right here. Nothing you need to change about that. Body facing the net, he's pushed off his outside foot. Contact point out in front. Strings flat on the back of the ball. And because he did all that stuff real well as he swung to contact, his follow through is going to look pretty solid as well. He extends out in the direction that he's hitting the ball, very nice extension. Turns the forearm and the wrist over like he has a watch on. Finishes across his body in a nice smooth motion. And if we rewind to contact, body also continues to rotate after he's hit. So we can see with this forehand that Kevin is inconsistent, but when he does things correctly, when he hits the ball right, he hits a very solid forehand. Only a couple tweaks in there that he needs to make to make this a pretty high level shot. With that in mind, let's now move on to comparing this forehand with Tommy Haas's forehand. Both pivot and turn their shoulders to start the motion, and Kevin has left both hands on the racket. He looks very similar to Tommy right now, not really too much difference. When they take the racket back, both load up on the outside leg, racket comes all the way back, bodies are sideways. There is a difference between Tommy's non-hitting arm, it's extended out across his body properly, versus Kevin, you know, he's pointing in the court like we said before, but otherwise this preparation looks very good. Swing into contact, they both push off the outside leg, rotate their bodies back towards the net. Both are facing the net at contact. And if we rewind it and watch the path the racket travels along, looks like a C for both Kevin and Tommy. The swing looks very similar. And at contact, both Kevin and Tommy are facing the net hitting the ball out in front of their body. Strings are flat on the back of the tennis ball. You may be saying, well, their non-hitting arms are in different spots. That is not a fundamental. You'll see pros have that arm in a number of different spots when they make contact. To follow through, both guys are extending out in the direction that they're hitting the ball. And then they turn their forearm and their wrist over, bring the racket across their body in a smooth and relaxed motion to slow themselves down. So we've just seen something very interesting. Up till now, all the amateur forehands we've looked at have seemed a little bit off. But that last forehand Kevin hit, it looked great. It looked a lot like Tommy Haas's forehand. And that's the point. That's the point we are getting at our thesis. The key to having a high-level forehand is not in these small details, the angle of your wrist, how you take the racket back. It's in the big stuff. And an amateur like Kevin, an amateur like you at home, can have a very high-level forehand a forehand that looks very close to the pros simply by focusing on and executing these five fundamentals each and every time you hit. So let's bring in one more amateur, me, because we haven't seen an amateur yet who has all five fundamentals and does them every single time they hit a forehand. And this is what that looks like. This is me just hitting forehands on a ball machine, and you can see this looks like a fundamentally sound forehand. Well, if you remember back to the beginning of this email course, I said that what separates amateurs from professionals is the fundamentals. 
well, if I have a fundamentally sound forehand, why am I not a professional? I mean, I'm nowhere near the professional level. Well, it's not just a matter of having the fundamentals. It's a matter of execution. How well do you do them? Tommy Haas, for example, has better execution, hits harder, more spin, more pace, way better timing. He's practiced for 20 years every single day, and he's a way better athlete than I am. But that doesn't matter. You don't need to practice every single day for 20 years to hit a high-level forehand. What you need to do, you certainly need to practice, but when you practice, you have to focus on what matters, what's actually important to hitting a high-level forehand.